Hey everyone. Last month, we recorded our first podcast with a live audience. The Young Society of Washington, D.C. invited us to explore the amazing final lecture of Marie-Louise von Franz, titled C.G. Jung's Rehabilitation of the Feeling Function in Our Civilization. In this, she cuts right to the chase, without evasion or hedging, and says that Jung's sole mission was to reconnect modern humanity with deep spiritual realities, and only from this living experience could a true morality emerge, one that is guided by a profound reawakening of feeling. Join us for the next two and a half hours as we bring these ideas to life with the help of a highly engaged, participative audience. We hope you'll enjoy it. Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Jung adds, the intellect proves incapable of formulating the real nature of feeling in conceptual terms, since thinking belongs to a category incommensurable with feeling. That being so, it is impossible to reproduce the specific character of feeling at all adequately. So as a differentiation, feeling as a function um, is not synonymous with the way that we use feeling in our colloquial language. For instance, when we say that you know, something feels soft or hard, you know, we're talking about sensation. If we say that I have a feeling that something's going to happen, that's intuition. And if I say I feel depressed, that refers to emotion. And feeling must be distinguished from emotion, especially. So feeling is the highly subjective sense of whether or not, or the way in which something is valuable to you. And it does not come out of a rational process. All of you who are feeling types know this when you go to buy a car. I'm a feeling type, I'm an ENFJ. So I have trained myself to go to consumer reports get pages and pages and pages of information and force myself to test drive four cars. But I can promise you when it comes down to the two cars I'm deciding between, it's going to be the one that feels better. (laughs) Uh, And, and uh, it, maybe it's a right choice and maybe it's not, but the feeling evaluation is going to decide what is higher or lower ultimately So feeling is a rational judging process that can quickly establish an attitude of value towards people, event, and things. And the more differentiated the feeling function is, 
you'll notice that your decisions are slowed down. As feeling types, when we're young, feeling good about something makes you move very quickly towards or away. As we become more psychological, our feeling function becomes more conscious and we talk to ourselves about it. We add a certain conscious process to it. The last bit I will um, share is a quote from Hillman, which I think is very relevant to von Franz's radical statement that we'll examine in the beginning, which is that we need a relationship to the self, to the transpersonal, in order to correctly use the feeling function. So Hillman says, through the feeling function, we appreciate a situation, a person, an object, a moment, in terms of value. A prerequisite for feeling is therefore a structure of feeling memory, a set of values to which the event can be related. What von Franz is deeply concerned about is that when we as human beings do not have a set of feeling memories about the divine, about the inner worlds, about the self, about God, about these spiritual beings that we encounter in our dreams and Jung encountered in the, and recorded in the Red Book, that we lack corrective feeling memories by which we then evaluate what we should move towards or away from, what we should act on or not act on. And she goes so far as to say that when our feeling memories are connected to the transpersonal, we have a correct base for a system of morality. That is an interesting, complicated idea because we often think of morality rising from the very intricate thinking process of the Greeks particularly, their systems of ethics. And we may remember from college or high school studying the Greek philosophers as they strove with their thinking to try to capture what is virtue and how should we and a culture align with virtue. But Jung says something that is pre-Socratic, which is there is an irrational, awesome, sometimes awful, experience that we have of the transpersonal. And that is what grants a sense of perspective and perhaps even moral authority. Yeah, so she's making a very, very big statement here. And she's kind of summing up Jung's work and saying that this is the big statement that he's making, that the mm -hmm. essence of his work was that we, we have to be in relationship to the sacred, if you will, or the numinous or the self, or we could use any other kind of language about it. And, and uh, from that, uh, these other things like ethics and morality flow. And of course, the corollary to that is we've gotten so far away from that as a culture, the kind of um, thinking function, the, the rationality and materialism has become so overemphasized in our culture that we're completely cut off from this ability to have uh, a real ethical sense. It really is um, audacious of von Franz to say this of Jung's teaching, uh, that it is a connection to God that matters. And you could call it the unconscious, you can call it the transpersonal, the spiritual, the non-material, uh, the self, but that it is from that that ethics and morality derive. Because somewhere there has to be a standard. And if it's just our own uh, egos that are kind of relativizing things of what's good or what's bad, 
something is missing, the center is missing. That standard is missing. And that that has led us to an overvaluation of this kind of um, rationalization of, of thinking that becomes to statistics or um, just think about things like uh, she says in an atomic war, we'll lose 60 million people, but that means we can still survive with 85 million. So we could risk it, you know, that th that's the extreme of what an unconnected, unethical, unfeeling uh, position looks like. Yeah, and that, that is a pretty accurate description of where we are. And she makes a powerful differentiation between the inherited moral philosophies. Let's say that in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we cherry pick from the book of Leviticus and then several other admonitions from the gospels. And then we pass these pseudo philosophic ideas on to the culture and make demands on people. But that is not considered moral in Jung's view mm -hmm. because it did not evolve from a lived encounter yes. yeah. from the divine itself. And we're going to keep on coming back to exactly that idea. I want to, if it's okay with you guys, we, we sort of agreed that we would more or less go through the essay kind of uh, as it is just to kind of keep us on track. I want to lift up something that she says on the second page. She talks about the way that statistical methods have taken over um, the field of psychology in particular. And, and um, you know, Jung has this uh, great thing that she, she talks about. He talks about it in um, volume 10, that statistics represents a thinking or mental abstraction and not reality as it is. In a heap of stones, the average stone may weigh one kilo, but we might not find in actuality one single stone, which weighs exactly one kilo. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna quote here from Jung. This is from volume volume ten, uh, paragraph five hundred three. He says, "We are all fascinated and overawed by statistical truths and large numbers, and are daily apprised of the nullity and futility of the individual personality, since it is not represented by any mass organization." So very much. Von Franz is picking up what he says in this important late essay that Jung wrote called The Undiscovered Self. Jung goes on to write in that essay that religion, what he refers to as religion, is the counterbalance to mass mindedness, that to this kind of statistical way of thinking. And of course, when he talks about religion, he's not for ta talking about an adherence to a particular dogma or a creed but exactly what Joseph just said about a lived experience. Um, he says, religion means dependence on and submission to the irrational facts of experience. These do not refer directly to social and physical conditions. They concern far more the individual's psychic attitude. Religion gives or claims to give a standpoint, thereby enabling the individual to exercise his judgment and his power of decision. It builds up a reserve, as it were, against the obvious and inevitable force of circumstances to which everyone is exposed who lives only in the outer world and has no other ground under his feet except the pavement. If statistical reality is the only one, then that is the sole authority. There is then only one condition, and since no contrary condition exists, judgment and decisions are not only superfluous, but impossible. Then the individual is bound to be a function of statistics and hence a function of the state or whatever the abstract principle of order may be called. Religion, however, teaches another authority opposed to that of the world. The doctrine of the individual's dependence on God makes just as high a claim upon him as the world does. And it goes on in this vein, saying very much, I think, what von Franz is picking up here in this essay, okay. that we have to have that lived experience with the numinous in order to have a standpoint against uh, this sort of 
hypertrophied rationality and materialism? The way that I relate to that is the kind of statistical thinking generalizes. And the path of individuation is not so interested in general information about human beings, although it acknowledges it. Analytic psychology is interested in the way in which you are unique, uniquely complicated, uniquely defined, uniquely gold and purposed, which brings us, as we said last night, to telos, that each person has a specific direction that they are moving in that is not relevant to a bell curve. Mm -hmm. so, so the opposite of generalizing is personalizing. Uh, what is my personal experience, my personal lived encounter with, let's say, your dreams? Mm -hmm. And that, that even when we take a dream to analysis, in some respects, we've objectified it. You know, now it's a little bit of an archetype, ar artifact. We've stepped away from it a couple of steps and can reconnect in another way. But it, it is that personalization of the, of the lived experiential knowing. And Jung uh, says that the religious function is an instinct. It's part of us, like, like hunger, sexuality, uh, the need for movement and the capacity for reflection. So, so all that kind of brings the world in, whereas generalization is like we've zoomed out. Mm, yeah. Before we, we leave this stuff about statistical way of thinking, I just want to bring in a concept that I just learned about that I find really interesting that I think is apropos, and that's something called the McNamara fallacy, which is named after Robert McNamara, the U.S. Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, and it involves a decision based solely on quantitative observations and ignoring all others. The reason given is often that these other observations cannot be proven. And this, the following is a quote from Daniel Yankelovich. He said, the first step is to measure what can easily be measured. This is okay as far as it goes. The second step is to disregard that which can't be easily measured or give it an arbitrary quantitative value this is artificial and misleading. The third step is to presume that what can't be measured easily really isn't important. This is blindness. The fourth step is to say that what can't be easily measured really doesn't exist. This is suicide. And I, and I think this is exactly what von Franz and Jung are talking about. It has uh, infected so many parts of our culture um, I mean, I, I have know people who work in kind of corporations and there's just constantly uh, giving out surveys to people, you know, where you, you rate on a Likert scale, you know, what the service was like. There was a great Black Mirror episode about this um, where, where every, everyone kind of received a score for every interaction they had. And, and of course, it's, it's really rampant in the field of psychology where, where, where everything, you know, we, we apply every, we apply, try to apply a metric to psyche, you know, how can you do that? So, and of course, you know, von Franz is, this is, this lecture is from the eighties, you know, and already that was true then it's so much more true now. So I think it's really prescient what she said here. As Deb had uh, commented in response that personal relationships and the personal is part of the solution. But Bon Franz also critiques that and in a way that I think is uh, confrontive and important. And she criticizes indirectly this Rogerian idea that we should cultivate the appearance of unconditional positive regard. Mm -hmm which is a repackaging of a kind of Christian, you know, all loving embrace. And what she suggests, and, and I think there's much truth to it, that it is impossible and invalidating to our individuality to suggest that we should or could, in fact, only have a single emotional tone, which has become in many therapeutic circles, a kind of, strange 
religion of kind of niceanity, <clears throat> where being nice and being unchallenging or never experiencing or admitting anything other than something sweetly maternal is considered counter therapeutic. And yet, I think if we are confronting ourselves, Jung demonstrated, and we are called to demonstrate, a full range of differentiated feeling in our interactions, which then gives other people permission to also express a full range of individuated feeling. Deb? I'm remembering um, Jim Hollis coming to the Philadelphia seminar uh, and saying uh, that that Jungians and Jungian students are all recovering nice people. And the room just exploded in laughter. But that goes to Jung, who von Franz says, he met every patient with his own personal feeling reactions, positive and negative, making the analytic hours a personal encounter and not a treatment. And that Jung differentiated this other tendency that we have in uh, sort of psychological professional circles to call everything that happens, uh, it's, it, well, it happened in the transference or uh, the count, my counter transference was thus and so and such and such. Uh, and there is that same, the, the uh, psychological analogy to statistics and just uh, distancing and generalizing. And that Jung said we should never use that language for the feeling relationship. Uh, which builds up in, in the course of therapy. Uh, and, and I really like that distinction and how this same kind of distancing and languaging uh, can do the same thing in psychology that statistics does in uh, some of the sciences. It's, we need to be up close and personal with ourselves and with the people we're working with no matter who it is we're working with. So being endlessly mirroring, endlessly infantilizing, endlessly affirming, endlessly sweet uh, and sentimental, which many of us are uh, ferociously pressured to do when we're going through our first course of therapeutic training, often in our colleges, is a kind of poison to the process of actual engagement. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's again, it's, it goes back to this idea about differentiated feeling, right? If you're sort of nice to everyone and uh, sort of super sickly sweet, you're, you're not in differentiated feeling. And from the standpoint of the feeling function and letting us communicate what is valuable or not valuable by creating a sweet sickly patina on everything, you're also giving everything the same value mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. nothing stands up under anything else. It's a kind of sleepy, gray, smiling haze mm -hmm. that, that is expressed in the analytic container, but also in our social relationships. You know, it's an extraordinary thing to think whether or not your friends know what you like or don't like. Are they capable of discerning that from interacting with you? It's a, the lack of differentiation of as if there's one way to be that's really right. I think we see it all over the place in the culture of, you know, these uh, purity spirals and uh, one way to be. And that underneath that um, purity and idealism and truth, in quotes, uh, can can lie a kind of brutality, mm -hmm. just as sentimentality can be the shadow side of, of brutality, v versus um, how do we differentiate from, from other people? I see it differently. I, I'm not sure that's uh, really right on, of, of being able to claim those kinds of important differences. I'm, I'm wondering if this would be a place for us to pause for a minute and just see if there are any reactions or questions from any of, of you. Uh, Lawrence, what, what did you wanna share? 
Yeah, good morning. I, um, so on the one side, I hear you saying that um, we have this uh, uh, reliance on, on, on rationality, which, which does into justice to uh, individuals. On the other side, what I notice in, in me is that uh, with a, um, an oversaturated uh, and short media cycle, I'm being bombarded all the time with, uh, yeah. with uh, these images, which stir that, that feeling function um, and it's, it's almost as if I feel almost as if I'm drowning in it. And, um, and so there's an urge on the, it, it creates an urge actually to run away to the, uh, the, uh, the numbers, um, because it's too much, at least for me. Um, can you talk about that drowning in the, or that, that saturation in, in, uh, contemporary life? Well, what I'm thinking about is, uh, there's, you know, what do we mean by that kind of feeling? that there's that kind of sort of saturated affect, emotion, and intensity. But that's not what von Franz and Jung are talking about as a differentiated uh, feeling function, that it's one of our rational functions, a valuing function. And, and so I think um, I agree with you. I have the same experience in the and the news cycle, but but that is not a well developed uh, feeling function. That's intensity of emotion. Well, and it's a manipulation, right? The, oh yes, the, absolutely. Of, of, it's a manipulation of our emotions. Yes, and and then we can get swept away with that rather than staying in this more integrated experience of the feeling function. Yeah. What 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 else did you want to say, Lawrence? It's not just the, the, the emotionality of it, because each one of those, let's say, whatever image it may be, it also invites the judgment from me, mm -hmm. right? So I have to now, I'm in, I'm, I'm, it's almost a demand that I, that I, that I make that, that, that judgment, good or bad, is right or wrong, all the time. Of course, it's not a, it's not a very differentiated function for me. Um, I'm a thinker. How can I even at attach to that, um, which is a lot more work for me, when there's so much so often. Jung said something famously, never make a career from your inferior function. You know, I remember one, one uh, time having coffee with a friend of mine, and she had begun dating one of the Microsoft millionaires uh, who had retired early. A big thinking type, brilliant fellow. And he had uh, just taken his first Reiki attunement class which is this kind of spiritual thing you lay hands on, your hands get warm, and it has a beneficial effect on people. And because um, intuition and sensation was his inferior function, he had thought he had d discovered the, the formula of the alchemist. He thought this was the most amazing thing. <laughs> he was going to dedicate his entire life to this process, and he was going to found Reiki clinics all over the world, uh, and go on this great big mission. And he was sorely disappointed for me to say that every housewife in Peoria is doing Reiki right now. Uh, and that the New Age healing community has moved far away from the miracle of Reiki. But it was a, it was a wonderful example of how overwhelmed he was by his inferior function and the overestimation of how this was going to absolutely change the world. So, Lawrence, one thing to ask of yourself when you're feeling overwhelmed is, can I step away and restore my superior function, which is thinking through this material that you're being exposed to rather than feeling through it, knowing that your feeling function is too close to the unconscious and therefore more vulnerable to complexes and other kinds of archetypal activations, which then cloud what is valuable. So go to your strengths when you feel overwhelmed. Uh, I think that's the most practical kind of material I could say. But it does bring up an issue, which is this differentiation between the feeling function and affect, which von Franz talks about a little bit later, yeah. which, where she is concerned about the over-intense activation of emotions from complexes. And a lot of media manipulation is an attempt to thrum a complex inside of you and then tether that to whatever the 
implicit directive is Mm -hmm. of the image or the movie, which is the basis of marketing. So I'm often humiliated that I can watch a Budweiser commercial where, (laughs) where like, you know, these horses are like racing down a path <laughs> to rescue a puppy from a snarling wolf, which was like on the Super Bowl a commercial. And and I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. I could feel tears welling up in my eyes. <laughs> I was totally manipulated. Yep. And then the music is there, and they're singing, and you know, it's all, yeah. uh, anyway, it, it's shameless, and it's shameless in its yeah. effectiveness. Yeah, yes. Which is so a little we, scary. We have to talk to ourselves yeah. about, wow, my nervous system is just a harp. And these people are just are thrumming it. And I am being moved. And I have to be very suspicious about having that much feeling about a bit of nothing on the screen, which cannot possibly improve the taste of Budweiser beer. <laughs> By the way, I must I must break those things apart <laughs> in my psyche and refuse to believe they are linked together. Yeah, I think we. It's really the sh- another way that that is the shadow side of our hyper rational culture. Is this exact kind of sentimentality? And oh, I, ha- I have this special feeling inside me when I see those horses. And von Franz says that, that then we go to making a cult uh, out of affects. And uh, we think that they express feeling. And it's really contaminated just with emotions at at a primitive level of emotion. Mm -hmm. Because when the feeling function is differentiated, it is not emotional. It is tethered to values, tethered to ethics, tethered to the self, the unconscious, the spiritual world, all of those kinds of things. There's an actual anchor somewhere, n- not just how I'm feeling in the moment be- because uh, of this uh, special feeling and being, as you said, Joseph, thrummed like a harp. Yeah, that's a great image. Let's take one more question and then we'll, we'll kind of dip back into the material. Tara? Tara yeah. Good morning. Everyone, thank you so much for doing the workshop. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I got a little confused, and I can't remember which of you talked about the transference and countertransference. That's that's such a um, powerful teaching from Jung and the the, uh, woodblocks of the psychology of transference. And so I wonder if you can... um, can talk about it in that way that he gives it such credence uh, in the context of the feeling function. It was somehow it was brought up. uh, Now I'm remembering it was brought up like it's used as statistics or separation where I feel it, I use it as a way of coming into that intersubjective field between the clinician and the client. But you're using it right, Tara. I think that von Franz, not having her article right here, von Franz was decrying something she was observing in the 80s, which is that Jungians themselves and other psychoanalysts were commenting on the transference instead of working in the transference. Yes. That, you, know, you might uh, tell your analyst that you love them, and the analyst would say, oh, that's just the transference. You see, you have this unresolved maternal issue, and then that's manifesting here, and let's move on. Uh, You know, something like that, where just naming the transference is somehow a form of therapy. And what Deb was bringing forward, and what Deb exemplifies actually in her work and even in her relationships, is jumping into the transference, which, for instance, uh, there are times where I'm, I'm in with an analysis and and I just love them so much. My heart aches in those moments. And, and for me to then say, Oh, by the way, I'm not like a counter transference moment, you know, right here. Um, That would actually be a rather distancing process. Just too distancing. right? Yes. But to see, but to sit in that and just feel my heart kind of burst into flames. And maybe that would be verbalized in some fashion or not. But to live that is the difference between having a feeling of 
phenomena uh, that's deeply intimate in the room versus just having some running commentary on it, which just annoyed the hell out of her. Yes. Oh, thank you for that clarity. And um, I don't know, while you were speaking, Joseph, I started to have an experience of how that might inform the feeling function uh, to metabolize one's countertransference or for the amylazan to metabolize their transference. They're actually developing the structure of memory for the feeling function. And it's because I feel that uh, transpersonal movement uh, come through in, in, and open the analytic container in a way. And I don't, I didn't understand how that was happening. And so here's a little bit of the mechanics of what you, uh, what von Franz has and has named or Jung has named as this structure of feeling memory. Oh, that's really, uh-huh. okay. Yeah, I'm thinking just from your gestures that that, that, that there's something about that that I'm on to. <laughs> yes, it sounds like you're living. Yeah. Quite right. Lovely, thank you. So moving on a bit, von Franz gives a few examples of how this excessive idealization of the sensate thinking function, which she believes has too much primacy, both in scientific circles and in other kinds of decision-making circles, justifies the violation of traditional cultures, justifies missionaries coming into certain areas in the guise of providing health care, but then undermining the psycho-spiritual beliefs of a culture And that what's missing in those moments, although they may seem helpful and well-meaning, is the ability for the missionaries to actually feel the suffering that they are inducing. That there is such a righteousness about doing what's good for you or what's good for that indigenous culture without being attuned to the pain that is evoked in the culture by devaluing their gods or their religious practices or their traditional healing methods. Von Franz provides um, a fairly lengthy quote from a Paraguayan Pai Indian uh, who talks about this. So, there's what they consider the state of health is a kind of wholeness. And uh, then he goes on to say, but then you white people come and make us dependent on money and other material things. This destroys our sense of healthiness. And in the end, you pull out of your pocket a little white pill and want to make us believe that if we eat that pill, this means healthiness, that this pill is health. Again, it's that objectivization, the rationalization, the moving away from, and not an encounter. So we're really talking about two different, two very different ways of looking at the world. Yes. And, and for me, when I read this essay, it brought me to this place that I know, if you listen to podcasts, I know I go here all the time. It's probably so irritating. But it made me think of Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Adversary. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and if for those of you that haven't read it, it's t- it just obviously it's really working in me. Even though I, I read it a couple of years ago, I keep on thinking about it. I think it's very relevant to the point that that Jung and von Franz are making. And the title comes from a kind of parable that I believe is in Nietzsche, where the the master is being served by the emissary, but then the emissary usurps the master. And the Gilchrist says that the right hemisphere is the master. And the left hemisphere is the emissary. And in our culture, and he dates this all the way back to Plato, um, there's been this gradual uh, hypertrophied left hemisphere. What he says is that the right hemisphere world is one of presence, one of encounter, one of individuality and of the implicit, and that the left hemisphere represents or represents these unique experiences and makes them abstractions or concepts. I think you can really see that in that quote about the, the Pi the Indians. 
Jonathan Haidt in a, a, a book uh, called The Righteous Mind um, gives a great image for just what you were talking about, Lisa, right and left hemisphere of the elephant and the rider. Uh, and we tend to think that uh, the rider is in charge, uh, but uh, actually it is the elephant. Much bigger, much more powerful, and with instincts and predilections, uh, uh, just a whole different life of its own. And uh, that's an image that I found just really useful. But we're creating this world <laughs> that's, yes. that's very much, you know, not taking into account the, what, what von Franz calls the differentiated feeling function, what I think McGilchrist would call the implicit or the world of the right hemisphere. And, and von Franz talks about, you know, you look around and you see, you know, bulldozers de destroying, you know, natural settings and put, putting up these ugly houses. And like, we all know something's wrong with that. Or, no, I think that's in Kingsley, actually, but it's, it's very similar to what she's saying. You know, we look at it, we like, we know that that's wrong. Um, we don't necessarily have language for it, but I think she's trying to give us the language. So this returns to very real moments in our social encounters, as well as our clinical encounters, and where we lend our aid in terms of intervention programs. Can we, like von Franz, first ask what is valued by this person? What is valuable to them? And in this Indian culture that she references, their relationship to the forest, to the sun, to the elements has a profound value. And the value is so substantive that to interfere with it is to interfere with the soul of their culture. And that kind of interference is often delivered with such cavalier impunity. And she goes on to amplify that point by uh, talking about how a government, a city or state government, will decide to, uh, you know, develop, quote unquote, a piece of land and dispossess a farmer and give him an adequate amount of money or some other piece of land, and that settles it all. That the farmer often loves his special place doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Or we take someone out of her slum apartment where she keeps a cat and feeds birds, and we wonder why they promptly die in their new so-called better surroundings with better hygienic conditions and no cats or birds to soil the place. I think she really conveys the heartbreak of that kind of approach. So one of the ways we track soul in ourselves is to notice where value is invested, feeling value. The way we track what is valuable to our children, even as they're developing, is to pay attention to what is valuable and to also track the way that evolves. Winnicott made this marvelous uh, observation about the transitional object, which is really about value. That, you know, little Billy has a favorite blanket that he must not be parted with, and you must not wash because it's sacred. And you must not take it away from the child. That they absolutely must invest in this object with all of the values which he theorized represented the caregiving relationship. And a time may come where the blanket is then lost and discarded in the backyard because the value has been integrated into another object organically. And once that happens organically, then there's an evolution in the civilization of the child, so to speak. But to violate that and take it away because it's unseemly or incongruent with the sterilization procedures of the family, let's say, is to do violence to the organic development of the child. And we do that to cultures. And sadly enough, it has been done to all of us. Mm -hmm. As we think about just our own 
inculcation into Western cultures. She finally lands fairly early in the essay on her radical statement that she's yeah. been inferring, that namely, we must first acknowledge the reality of the unconscious before we can do anything else. And remember that for particularly the, the early Jungians who might have been more bold, the unconscious means God, the self, another spiritual realm, all of the uncanny numinosums that we can brush against or have brushed against, and that everything in Jung's system that in fact makes it different from Freud's system or other schools of psychoanalysis or modern psychology is the primacy of the reality of the unconscious. And she makes a very reasonable step. She says, the acknowledgement of the reality of the unconscious. Now she's going to say the encounter with those realities is really important, but it starts with the acknowledgement of them, that they are real and valid. I think that's so important. Um, and that's something that uh, I think comes up in all of us, and it certainly comes up in the consulting room, is that first we can think something, we can acknowledge, we can consider, we can imagine. And uh, then I think of it sort of like a coffee percolating and let it kind of uh, work its way down into an experience or a felt sense. But that part of just acknowledge the reality of the unconscious is a starting place any of us can do any anytime. And von Franz goes on to say that, that this other world of non-material beings, this is the only foundation of real ethics uh, and the disregard of the numinous powers is, according to Jung, the, italicized, the essence of evil. So, so this is radical stuff. It's that important. I'd like to really sit into the feeling <laughs> about disregard of the numinous powers, according to Jung is the essence of evil. To really feel one's way into that. And then to confront all of the innumerable cultural systems that press on us to disregard that. Yeah, how active that is in our culture. And we can tolerate that happening with, in, in such a casual way. You know, telling your child that they don't have an invisible friend or that trees can't talk or that dreams are ridiculous, you know, the, the detritus of the day. And it, it's not in the great big assaults against the religious world that this happens, it's in the small, reasonable encroachments that we tolerate and comply with without even quite realizing it. Are you, do you find yourself just a little embarrassed to talk about a numinous experience, just a little ashamed, you know, at a dinner party to say, you know, I went to a meditation retreat and I, this happened to me. And how many people who are my friends, will feel a lockup to dare say that even casually in a conversation. How did we get there? And whether or not we decide to speak these things in social settings, can we at least route out those weeds in our own psyche to fight that feeling of embarrassment or shame or danger about owning our own brushes with the divine, such as we understand it. So we, th we thought we'd maybe take a minute here at this point and uh, open it up and hear 
what you all think of this really audacious claim that ethics derives from a relationship between man and God, and that it is this direct experience of the numinous that really undergirds uh, our humanity in a way. You know, one of the things that I've also been really fascinated by is the cultural rise of interest in things like ayahuasca and DMT and psilocybin as a therapeutic shaped intervention. And it's not uncommon for many of these drugs to provide experiences of the numinous. The difficulty that I have with them, quite frankly, is that Jung earned those experiences and then made use of them differently. And the gods can sometimes punish us for stealing fire prematurely. I'm also just, I mean, I'm, I'm, I find this interesting and I'm not opposed to it. And I find myself being a little bit skeptical of anything that sort of promises, um, uh, you know, transpersonal experience and the, what's the equivalent of a pill. It seems like we're very oriented to thinking about uh, that kind of quick um, shortcut. Instagod. <laughs> and yet it may very well be it. You know, I've had some friends that have done DMT and they swear that these entities, these non-material beings that they encounter, which by the way, many people report similar beings with similar qualities, and they seem to be popping into a, a plane of being mm -hmm. that has uh, recognizable characters, yep. which by the way, Henri Corban wrote about as in his analysis of Sufi, Sufi mysticism, that the Sufis seem to consistently report a landscape, the mundus imaginalis, an inner landscape that seems to function similarly when you achieve it mm -hmm. through these various transcendental techniques. So uh, I have a similar concern, Lisa, that yeah. you do around it, but I'm also more concerned with the unpreparedness to come face to face with some of these forces and what might the cost be even though an encounter of that kind at some point is essential relative to Jung's thesis. Well, let's, let's open it up to you guys. What, what do you all think about this thesis? Um, I, I have found, um, I mean, in, in very few experiences that have been irrational and um, very valuable, that if I talk about them, first of all, I find it difficult to claim them in a way. Mm -hmm. or I'm thinking about one experience, because I'm going to sound a little bit sort of bizarre. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, maybe I'm going to be told this is magical thinking or, you know, you're, 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 you're in a delirium of interpretation. I mean, there are these coin phrases mm -hmm. to tell you that you're not doing, yeah, I mean, no. No, this is not possible. Yep. Now, that's just what Joseph was talking about when he mentioned, you know, you don't just claim that I went to a meditative uh, place and had an experience. It's not culturally uh, usual or even accepted. No, there's no place for it. Mm -hmm. Or we are responsible for creating a place where that can be honored. Yes, Sundance? Yeah. I, uh, I've been practicing shamanism for many, many years now, uh, since the early 90s. And, um, and I don't use uh, plant medicines like ayahuasca and so on. I, uh, I use just a steady drum beat and, and I can just journey without a drum, honestly, but that's me, whatever. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is though, I, I, I'm surrounded by people who we're seeking that stuff. We talk about it. I do lots of rituals. I, I'm always on that path of seeking mm -hmm. newness and so on. Um, so for me, that's it's, it's the normal way to be. It, it's the, it is the common conversation at the dinner party because I'm surrounded <laughs> by the people that do that. Stuff. So, um, but but the thing I thought was interesting was how even even though I that's like that is the waters I swim in. 
I lead this weather sh shamanic circle that works with spirits of the weather. And I had this journey this week about how needing to go into the oceans and the deep waters and that the oceans are holding a lot of emotional pain of the collective and that that is part of what is contributing to storms. It's not the whole thing and it's not the, you know, there's more and there's the science and all, but, but that message sort of freaked me out because I was like, oh, can I really say this? Even to my woo-woo friends, <laughs> is it going to be too much? Is that going to be like just that idea of um, that, that, uh, that the container the, of the oceans is holding more than just water and sea creatures? You know, and of course it's a symbol of the unconscious, and I know that too, but there's also the physical oceans, you know, so what there are these different mean? levels? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and I was just sort of like, Ooh, am I going to be brave enough to bring that message, which I don't even fully understand of how we're going to work with this. Um, and, and I am, I'm brave enough to do it. I'm going to do it. I've already <laughs> started to share about it, but do you know what I'm saying? Like, like there's, there is that, um, we're so saturated with science and the scientific, you know, like storms do come from the ocean. That is a scientific fact. Mm -hmm. What this is talking about is another layer um, mm -hmm. that's there. So anyway, I just wanted to share about that. I, yeah. I'm really enjoying the discussion. And I, I don't know if all our ethics and stuff comes from having that connection with the numinous. You know, I, I can't speak to that because I think of my friends who are, not spiritual at all or atheist and so on and does that mean they can't you know what does that mean for them or does that mean I, I certainly know atheists who are moral and ethical well just because you're atheist doesn't mean you don't have a connection with something numinous and, and that's the question I mean maybe you can speak yeah. to that some like like for the people who don't either have a religion or a spiritual practice at all but how are they how can they have that connection with the numinous they dream. But do they, do they plug into it the way others do? You know, Jung said the decisive question of a man's life is, is he connected to something infinite or not? To me, that's the pithiest way of talking about this. And, how, and you know, some of us feel connected to something infinite through, um, you know, raising our children. Some of us feel connected to something infinite through... A spiritual practice. Some of us feel connected to something infinite because we have a vocation where we're giving to the world through our work. Yeah. So I, th I think there are lots of ways. Yeah, I, I I really like what you just said, Lisa, and I've been wanting to pull this idea of the numinous. Yeah, you know, I can't, kind of want to pull it down from the sky and uh, put it, you know, out in the backyard. Uh, that the connection um, can be with nature. It can be with a child. The numinous comes in all sizes. And I, th I think we can be open to it in the here and now, in these small moments, if we can catch them. Uh, something, something astonishing happened. Uh, I took it in. I was present to it. And it doesn't need to be called the numinosum. This <laughs> okay. is where I think that you know, our, our atheist friends can be liberated. Yeah. Uh, my, my clients that are atheists, they're, uh, it's clearly an evolution based on a rejection of uh, a religious system that they participate in and often and may very well have been abused by in some fashion. And so I, I feel very aligned with their spiritual immune systems just pushing the stuff out of them that they feel has done them such a disservice. And yet they still enjoy talking about their dreams and wondering about them, and they still are capable of, of exalted experiences. And, uh, and I'm okay if they develop their own language for that. I don't care if they call it brain chemistry or neuronal activation or brainwave patterns, as long as, as long as they feel it's legitimate for them. And that they take it seriously. I mean, yes. I, think, I think that's that's sort of the heart of this is that rather than treating it as nothing but that we give it some measure that we afford it some gravitas in our lives. Yeah. And 
Yeah, I was thinking linking into what Sundance was saying in all of this conversation about spirituality and religion and something larger and the dream world. Um, that I think when we're connected to whatever that is in ourselves, that that will come in either through the dreams or through, for me, um, when this whole um, COVID period started, this wasn't a dream, but I had a recurring image that would just keep coming in during the day of a huge whale rolling very slowly deep in the ocean. And it just seemed to be a sense that something was shifting of, of great magnitude. Mm. And I felt that that was a numinous experience for me. It just kept coming back. And it came before a series of dreams that were very much related to the pandemic. Um, that were uh, a kind of restructuring and bringing um, aspects of the self into relationship with what was happening in our world today. So I don't consider myself religious, but I consider myself to be deeply connected, connected to the luminous. So I think this conversation is beautiful around that. And I think this is where language gets so tricky and sticky. Uh, what do we mean by religious? You know, and it often goes to some kind of formal aspect of religion, which has doctrine and dogma and rules versus what you just talked about, Anne, which is I feel connected. It's, you know, something that's alive in one. I, I'm really, really grateful for this program um, and to be regrounded in this essay. When I originally came to analytic work, it was because of reading and encountering Marion Woodman. And of course, she was an analysis and of Anne France. And then the person I went to, though I didn't realize it, I mean, I didn't seek him out because he was an analysis and of Von France. But, and this essay so deeply informs how both of them work. And so you, you have this holding, you know, in a relationship where you are encouraged to hold and value this part that as an NFP, uh, as a storyteller and a children's librarian was so central to me, you know, the inner world and dreams and so on. But then something else raises its head. And that is the fact that analysis is sometimes a power relationship. There is this, my experience was that there was a deep intrusion um, within the relationship and without on this very precious thing that had been encouraged. And the reason I moved to speak about that is that what you said about uh, psilocybin and MDMA. Now, having been grounded in the experience with these very classically trained people and having had the experience of working step by step through my own, un own unconscious, I stand for myself. And, and being a powerful intuitive with a trauma history, I have been afraid of chemicals and my over-response to them. However, in the last few years, I've spent a lot of time assisting Bessel van der Kolk. And he is the lead investigator on MDMA in the Boston area. And I've also, um, I live in Baltimore, Washington. So every year I get to hear the guy who's in charge of the psilocybin studies at Hopkins speak. And he is one of the most religiously respectful, spiritual, the Hopkins guy stands very much with religion and spirituality and very carefully. The first investigations are, are about the psilocybin as a religious experience and as a, and over a 20 year period, they have seen so few clients, it's breathtaking when, when you realize the new studies are showing how deeply effective what they are doing is, particularly for four stage cancer patients, encountering a religious experience that gives them equanimity toward death. Then in Bessel's work, which is with people who have, he sees the most traumatized, people who were raped at three and four, people who committed atrocities in the wars. He sees the people nobody else can handle. And so those people's fear of encountering a good God, of encountering what can, who can see what they've done and what they've experienced is amazing. And so that it be introduced in a way that is not part of, part of a power, one up, one down relationship, which is so terrifying to them, is incredibly important. Now, I can't believe that I'm the person speaking for this, by the way, 
but I do get to hear these people speak about the other side of it. And like Sundance with shamanism, you're not so closely tied into that one-on-one -on -one relationship that can recapitulate the original hurt so deeply that you're sent off, you know, um, I don't, I think that's as far as I can articulate mm. it, but do you know what I'm trying to say? That, that was very rich. And, and over, arch, overridingly, I want to emphasize my incredible gratitude to be in this conversation and to reverse, to revisit what is so good about analysis and what I love about content. I appreciate those perspectives. You know, it seems to me that yet again, and thank you for that, it has to do with our relationship to it whatever the it is of, you know, do I just want to get high and have a really a great adventure? Or is there really kind of a spiritual quest? Uh, and that then it can be a bridge to something deeply transcendent and healing. So it's, you know, it's not about the psilocybin. It's, it's about, you know, what our relation is, our attitude uh, which is exactly what von Franz is talking about here. Yeah, and in the, both these programs, such a container is built. Like the MDMA is delivered over several months with several full-day, full-weekend appointments with the same two therapists sitting with you through the whole thing. Yeah. So just want, feeling is valued. The feeling function is deeply honored in the way yeah. they've constructed it. Yes. Yeah. And I've, I will just share, I've seen a video um, Richard Schwartz, who does internal family systems, has a video in one of his uh, classes of working with a traumatized veteran. And it was deeply transformative and, and meaningful because that was the means by which this man was brought into connection uh, with deep feeling and experience. So we, you know, we can't just say, you know, is this stuff good or bad? Um, that's not what it's about. Uh, you know, it's the same thing as uh, the farmer whose land is going to be taken for development and he'll just get paid. Wait a minute. Uh, what's the relationship and where are the ethics? What is it tied to? And is it tied to the unconscious, the self, something truly deep and grounding? And this speaks to where von Franz is going to next in her essay, which is methodology. Um, that it's one thing for us to declare the curative power of the numinous or the absolute necessity to encounter non-material beings as part of developing both a sense of ethics and of healing. But how, how can we do that given the technology we have access to? I think the experiments with MDMA, other substances, other technologies, or uh, the Monroe Institute's doing some interesting stuff with brainwave technology, the resurgence of ancient uh, methods, whether it's shamanism or Egyptian magic for that matter, these things are, are moving in the collective because we are looking for technology. And I think of these ancient uh, religions, in a sense, encoding technology. The beat of a drum does something to the brain, to the soul, uh, and the soul figures out what to do with that and to ride upon it. My background is in the Kabbalah, and the mystical techniques there are, um, you know, I've spent my life since I was 17 uh, experimenting and moving through that world and the results that it produces. But undoubtedly, it's that drive for a method with which to do this. And Jung's method was active imagination. Absolutely. He was taken. And what I love about Jung is that it does not seem that he was informed by a tradition. He was a true maverick, an absolute wildcat researcher that the unconscious grabbed him um, and showed itself to him. And he had to find out what he was going to do about that. While well, many of us are going from being uninitiated to finding a way in through the various ways that we're experimenting. Mm -hmm. But the, when Franz says we need to offer a way in order for people to have an alternative to this rationalism or being narcoticized by social media. 
just just one more thing about active meditation. Deb and I were lucky enough a, about a year ago to visit. We we went to Kuznacht and and we were able to visit the von Franz Tower, which I hadn't even realized she had a tower, but she had one close to Bollingen. And um, upstairs, it was very moving. There was her typewriter in the corner. I was like, oh my god! Um, but she had a room for active imagination. Can you imagine? A little tiny, totally unfurnished room in her little, very small tower. It's called the tower, but it's a, a, a cottage, really. And uh, out of this limited space, there was a whole room just for active imagination. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Before we dive back into um, von Franz, and by the way, I should say what we're hoping to do is talk about the essay for about the next 30 minutes or so, and then spend the last hour on dreams. So that's our plan. (laughs) Hopefully we can stick to it. Before we go back to the essay, though, I want to say Joseph turned me on to this book. I wrote it in the chat. It's called Catafalque, Carl Jung and the End of Humanity by Peter Kingsley. And it is quite a read. I'm not all the way through it yet, but um, I'm a good way through it. And I would highly recommend it. It's a, a pretty wild ride. But he's essentially saying the same thing. And interestingly, he does the same thing that McGilchrist does, which is trace this problem back all the way to around the time of Plato. They, they both pick Plato as kind of the beginning of this distancing from uh, this sort of direct experience. So McGilchrist would say, you you know, that you need this necessary distance that's provided by the perspective of the left left hemisphere, but it's kind of gotten out of control. So I I wanna just sort of paraphrase uh, a a section here of how to follow. Kingsley says that therapy in ancient Greece had this particular meaning Therapeia theon, which meant attending to the divine or caring for the gods. And it was Plato who said, well, why do we need to care for the gods? You know, mm-hmm. they, they can, uh, they don't really need our attention. And, and uh, he, he says, um, quoting here, Kingsley says, there's no need to say too much about the enlightened rationality here, which from any reasonable perspective all sounds exactly the way it should. And so far, we have only come as far as Plato. His greatest disciple, Aristotle, is still waiting at the next turn in the road. This is the way it works, though. One more milestone in the human mind's adventure of submitting everything to the criteria of its own reasoning. Just another pace in separating people from the sacred. So it goes from let's let's make sure that we're taking care of the divine to let's make sure the divine takes care of us. This is the loss of that connection, that lived experience with the numinous or however you want to talk about it. And, you know, chewing on this recently, one of my analysis came in this past week. Well, I guess appeared on the screen this past week and said, um, you know, apropos of something else, she said, she said, you know, God is not a vending machine. <laughs> and, and, I, and I thought, yes, it's, it's, it's exactly what Kingsley's saying, you know, is, is that we've got, we've got the, the script flipped somehow. Kingsley makes this ar- argument in a very sobering way. 
as the title of the book suggests, that not only is it true that humanity is grounded in the non-rational and in these spiritual planes, but that the violation of the primacy of that relationship is causing the dissolution of the Western culture. Which is exactly what McGilchrist says as well. In different language, he says exactly the same thing. And Jung and von Franz were as well, and particularly Jung towards the end of his life, 1959, he was despairing. Uh, By the way, as was Freud in the last years of his life, there was a great faith in consciousness that if we could just become aware of the unconscious, that we could then vaccinate ourselves against the worst parts of human nature in ourselves and in our leaders. And that has not proved to be true that the expansion of consciousness or awareness creates a platform and that we are required to build a temple on that platform in order to substantially restore our relationship to the numinous, to the divine, to sacralize our lives and our relationships. And as Dev has said, many times that this can be in plain speak and in the wisdom of the family and the kitchen and it can be in the exalted mountaintops that we aspire to as well but it must be present in some fashion and there are signs which many of us i think are all attending to that the values and guiding images of the western world and certainly the united states seem to be eroding very, very quickly in a way that's alarming. That phrase of um, having a foundation and building a temple uh, reminds me of something we thought we might bring in today that now we three refer to all the time. It's Max Zeller's dream. There was an analyst named Max Zeller uh, who at the conclusion of World War II, he was American, And he was worried about being an analyst at a time when the world was still in such distress and upheaval. Uh, He's seeing 25 or 30 people a week. And was he really um, in his right work, uh, given the state of the world? He uh, brought to Jung uh, this dream. He went over to Zurich and to see Jung. He says, Here's a dream of last night, and I think it's very important. I am occupied with it. And here's his dream. A temple of vast dimensions was in the process of being built. As far as I could see, ahead, behind, right, and left, there were incredible numbers of people building on gigantic pillars. I, too, was building on a pillar. The whole building process was in its very first beginnings, but the foundation was already there. The rest of the building was starting to go up and I and many others were working on it. And Jung said, yeah, you know, that is the temple we all build on. We don't know the people because believe me, they build in India and China and in Russia and all over the world. That is the new religion. Do you know how long it will take until it is built? And Max Zeller says, how should I know? Um, And Jung says, I know. He said about 600 years. And he said he knew it from dreams and other, this new religion will come together. But I I think uh, it's such a lovely image of how each of us does our part of separately uh, through our own processes of growth and development and individuation and we are part of a greater whole. In a way, we need to develop a differentiated feeling relationship, which includes a kind of distance between the powers within, an I-thou relationship with the gods, and 
something of a critical religious conviction and a relatedness to human beings. So we're relating to human beings outside and relating to the archetypal powers inside and that those formula have to happen simultaneously, that we are straddling the inner and the outer worlds. Now, in my mystical tradition, the Kabbalah, which is not mine personally, by the way, but I practice, one of the techniques that we try to do is to attend to the inner worlds as we are in conversations with other people, which is a way of trying to straddle two worlds at once. Some of the psychoanalysts wrote about this. They came upon it in their own fashion, talking about field phenomena or tracking the reverie of the analyst while they are listening and engaging. To have a foot in both worlds, to not be overwhelmed with those things, and to take all of them very seriously. In order to do this, von Franz talks about love, this feeling of deep empathy, as well as a certain amount of logos objectivity, which I think it comes to this issue of being generative without being reactive. So Jung calls this new form of love a whole making effect of a certain kind of eros, which is emanated from the individual personality. And what Jung is saying is that individuation, which includes the deeply intimate forging of relationship to the gods, allows us to love the people around us in a very unique way that stimulates a kind of whole making and healing process in the people around us. This is one of the hopes that we have in analytic training. Analytic training is one of the few therapeutic disciplines where analysts are required to be in a personal analysis. And for some of us, that has gone on for decades because the way of being of the analyst, your way of being, can be a medicine in the way that you love, in the intimacy and empathy of the relationship. She goes on to invoke some alchemical symbolism, uh, which I find very moving. I know we all relate differently to some of these metaphors, but she talks about this true person, the pure person, that he is no other than just what he is, that he must be entirely human, who knows and possesses everything human and is not adulterated by any influence or admixture from without. Now, doesn't that sound very much like individuation? Where we have ruthlessly analyzed the way in which we have been colonized by ideas and images that are not indigenous to our own soul, and that we have routed them out from the forests and jungles of our being and restored the natural ecology, which allows us to be in a true, authentic relationship to the people around us and that the intensity of that relationship can have a healing influence on the people around us. And as some of you undoubtedly have experienced, that can also be disturbing to them. <laughs> Deborah, I see you nodding over there. Well, it links me immediately back to something you, you all shared earlier this week in a broadcast, or maybe it was from a couple of weeks ago when you were speaking about the intuitive. And if you're an intuitive and you're speaking from yourself, 
and you are unaware of the thing that you made note of, which was the necessity to build a bridge between what you're about to so forcefully announce and what you <laughs> offer. And yet it comes from the deepest place of your being and is actually informed, even if it comes out coldly, by your deep caring for the other with whom you're sharing it. So it is the fruit of your analysis and all your ruthless uprooting of stuff that is not true. And it is true. And it is unwelcome, disturbing, upsetting. And you're trying to come from love. I'm just, that's what I was really nodding about. And, and we can embrace that impact, Deborah, if we abandon the weediness of being nice and being pleasing that being nice and pleasing has rarely has anything to do with love. That love is frightening in its demand for relatedness. And all of the resistances to that relatedness rise up like those seven-headed creatures and try to shame us or we shame ourselves or try to tell us that if it isn't soothing to the baby, you must be doing something wrong. You know, uh, von Franz uh, ends this really remarkable paper with language that I think she really chose specifically. She says, perhaps Jung will be remembered as a knight who restored to the community the feminine principle of love. I think that's a great image uh, because knights are not, you know, pussy-footed patting you on the head kinds of people. Uh, there's a, a wonderful image there of a, a certain kind of ferocity uh, in service to this principle of Eros. Yes, it's vigorous. Yeah. Yeah. If it disturbs people, it disturbs people. That's, um, that's just part of it. And, and Jung had this incredible dream when he was in India, I believe, that he had to return to the West and seek the grail. <laughs> So that that was very much. I, I think it's exactly in in uh, that's what what when Franz was talking about. I'd love to just read this last quote. It's actually um, von Franz quoting Jung. It's just so beautiful, and and he talks about the difficulty of having this kind of differentiated eros. Jung writes, a differentiated feeling relationship would include a deep empathy and closeness to the other and a certain distance based on differentiation, an understanding and a not understanding, the latter consisting of a silent respect of the mystery of the other's individuality. To someone who loves blindly, the creation of this distance is very painful, but it guarantees also his or her freedom, without which no individuation is possible. This is of paramount importance Jung thought has very relevant consequences, I think, for our immediate future. And uh, I'd love to share just Khalil Gibran's poem on marriage, which I think um, says this in such a way that's lovely. In his book, The Prophet, he writes on marriage, you were born together and together you shall be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. I, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. But let there be spaces in your togetherness, and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give each other of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together and be joyous, but let each of you be alone. Even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping. For only the hand of life can contain your hearts and stand together, yet not too near together. For the pillars of the temple stand apart, and the oak tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. And with that, I think it's time to switch to the dreams. So here's our first one, um, submitted by a 26-year-old female. 
and I'm going to read it, but you also have it on your screens, thanks to the wonderful technology at Zoom. I was on a big ship on the ocean looking out at the water. I saw what looked like the Loch Ness monster in the water. I thought, awesome, this must be a big eel or an optical illusion or whatever people see when they think it's the Loch Ness monster. Suddenly, I was in the water balancing on a log and the monster was right next to me. I still thought it was an illusion, but I felt anxious. I was trying not to fall into the water. I cried, help, get me back on the ship. And some people helped me crawl back onto the ship. But then the monster followed me onto the ship and started attacking me with long tentacles, wrapping around me and suffocating me. That was when I realized it was the real Loch Ness Monster. I cried out, no, no, help me. But everyone was gone and nobody was there to help me. Then I woke up. Sounds like an average Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> I have just sort of an immediate kind of thought about this dream that really jumps out at me. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just kind of run with it for a minute and then, then you guys can, can jump in. But, but she sees this, this Loch Ness monster and she thinks, oh, awesome. How cool. It must be a big eel or an optical illusion. Um, she doesn't believe it's real. She gets in the water and even though the monster's right next to her, she still thinks it's an illusion. And, and she's, she's trying not to fall into the water, which we might imagine would be the unconscious. She wants to get back on the ship. She realizes that the monster's real at the end. And, and I think that this is very much like something we were talking about last night. We were talking about the objective psyche and the fact that it's real. It's not just a pretty concept or an intellectual exercise the objective psyche or, or the collective unconscious is real you know jung talked again and again about the reality of the psyche and i think here it is it, it's it's so interesting how this dream plugs into what we've just spent the past two hours talking about because it's like here is the encounter with the numinous right i mean that's what this is this is an image of that but she defends against it and, and says, no, 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 it's not really real, right? That's what our rational faculty does. Rationality says, no, there's no such thing as the Loch Ness Monster. This is just an optical illusion. But I, I really think this dreamer is so lucky because her unconscious is not going to let her escape this encounter. It reminds me a little bit of um, Jonah. Uh, he's supposed to go to Nineveh. And he doesn't want to, he wants to avoid it. He wants to avoid the call, but he is pursued by God and uh, is eventually thrown overboard and swallowed by the whale. And that, that's kind of happening here. She's kind of getting about to be swallowed by, by the whale, which is um, you know, a night sea journey, but it opens up the encounter with divine. So I think it's a great dream actually, even though it's scary. Yeah. It, it doesn't it uh, really portray what we've been talking about of uh, sort of that that over rationalized mind that just you know kind of minimizes or dismisses uh, the objective psyche, the numinous, and the numinous has a dark side as well as a bright side from the point of view of ego. Here is her encounter that says, "I'm really real." I'm not an optical illusion, and I'm not a big eel, and it wraps the tentacles around her, and it, it is an encounter. She doesn't want to get in the ocean and fall into the unconscious. But instead, she has an encounter with a kind of uh, another kind of contact uh, with, with what seems monstrous, and, and what seems rob monstrous is what would, might rob us of eco control or free will or agency. Um, I like your analogy to Jonah and the whale, Lisa. This is the real deal. And what has grabbed her? And I would be curious about what m might, where there might be an analogy to what's going on in uh, this dreamer's life. Of where is this happening that something is being minimized or otherwise kind of downplayed that's really real? And when we don't pay attention to the objective psyche, 
then it becomes a monster. I, I think uh, this and Deb summed it up really beautifully. This goes into you know Jung's work on answer to Job, that that really challenging the fantasy that the divine is is sweet and lamb-like, and you know Jesus is a shepherd and uh, and all of that kind of sweet and life affirming and and uh, assuring aspect of the divine. But the, you know the problem of Job is that you know God gives Job a pretty bad time of it. And how does one make theological piece of that? I think for Jung being raised in a ministerial family, that was probably more poignant than maybe for some of us. But what it led him to accept in himself and his philosophy is that the self is unpredictably indifferent to human suffering. And beyond that, perhaps suggests that human suffering and suffering consciously is an essential part of psycho-spiritual maturation. And it cannot be bypassed. So we have the book of Job in the Old Testament. And then we have another kind of Job in the story of Christ and any of the other suffering individuals who have uh, attracted God's attention, not even wrath, but just God's attention. So it speaks to, on one level, the extraordinarily powerful effect that the self has upon the ego and that the ego, whether or not it likes it, must submit. Now, if we can do cultivate a willing submission to the self, we can run towards our own transformation and co-participate in it and perhaps even mediate some aspects of the discomfort around it. But cold or uncold, the gods are present and they are going to have their way with us. Interestingly, if this were entered into with active imagination, as I mentioned yesterday, the, the primary question always should be, what are you here to teach me? And our shamanic friends um, can give us some confidence that, you know, submitting to the power animal, even if this tentacled creature wants to gobble you up or drag you down into its secret caverns um, under the ocean, that being taken by these powerful figures and allowing them to do what they will with us is often a powerful initiation, very powerful. And not that it won't be difficult, but that we can have some faith that we will come back more fully ourselves, although the process may be uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, this is really an archetypal dream and I, I know we, one of the things we said last night was that archetypal dreams are an intervention. You know, and, and Jung said something like, paraphrase this, but a dream is a snapshot of something that's already happened in the psyche. This is happening. <laughs> this person's being kind of uh, grabbed against her conscious will uh, and, and invited into an encounter with something really numinous from the depths. I, I realize we already said this, but, but just another way of saying it, Jung talked a lot about the sort of nothing but attitude. It's nothing but. That's very much what the ego is doing here. It's nothing but a big eel or an optical illusion. So I, I think that this is um, the beginning of a kind of, as Joseph said, a kind of initiation. It strikes me, here's a, a pretty young person, you know, she's 26 years old. And you know, she's uh, interested in Jung. So it, it's, I, it's not surprising that she's here. And I think it's a good thing because she, she knows somehow that she needs to wrestle with this, this monster who may appear much less monstrous once you turn a friendly face toward it. I wonder if um, th there are other things that, that maybe you all see that are here today that we didn't touch on in this dream or things that you have questions about. 
it's just a sort of it's just a question really because I, I wonder how familiar the dreamer is with the Loch Ness monster. There seems to be a, a familiarity, but at the same time, I suppose just just because I'm English, um, the Loch Ness monster is generally it's a, it's a contained, very deep piece of water, but it's somehow out in the ocean, which feels a much more expansive, freer system than it would normally be in. That's actually a really good point, Jeanette. Thanks for bringing that up because that is, that is, and she says that she was very interested in cryptids when she was younger. She was interested in the Loch Ness Monster. Let me just find it. She says, I was really into cryptids as a kid. I remember researching Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. I didn't think they were real though. <laughs> and now she is learning that they're real. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yes, Jeanette, what a great point because of course um, Loch Ness is a, is a lake. Um, but this dream takes place on the ocean. So it's sort of the quality of the body of water. You know, it's not just a deep lake. It's something even larger and more encompassing, um, more vast and, in fact, oceanic. Feels like the monster's out of its box. Yes. Ooh, that's yes, good. Yep. that's lovely. Mm-hmm. And, and Jeanette, am I right? But isn't the Loch Ness monster usually thought of as female? And it's called Nessie or something like that. Yeah, and it's everything is kind of loop snake. I wonder if there's something here about the, uh, you know, the feminine principle in its, in its darker aspect, that uh, you know the dreamy goes on the log and doesn't want to fall into the water, so it comes to get her on the ship. Jeanette, did you just say something about a blue snake? No, not a blue one, but it's seen as a loopy snake. Usually the, snake. On, the, okay. on the postcards, the ones that try and dress it up in a bit of a comedic character, it's usually got a straw hat on, and then it's seen as kind of looping in and out of the water. Um, I know there was another hand raised, and I think it was iPad. <laughs> yes, I've unmuted myself. My name is April. I just want to uh, mention how moved I am by the image of a Loch Ness monster chasing uh, a young woman with the energy required to get her attention. I'm very moved that Psyche is so Mm -hmm. invested in the individual that it would present itself in such a way that it cannot be ignored. Oh, that's beautiful, April. And I have very much the same feeling about this dream. Like I, I'm sure it was really terrifying, but I, but as a, as a someone kind of receiving the dream as an observer, I, I, I also have this sense of kind of awe about the psyche that it's, it's not going to let this dreamer miss her encounter. Tara, did you want to say something? I'm wondering. It's back to yesterday. The way, um, because I. I was a little unsettled with the idea of the, well, no, I was excited by the idea of the dream ego. Had not heard of that before. And, um, and how you decided that the dream ego called the tall, towering 30-foot image a, a, a wizard. But here you don't decide that the dream ego called it the Loch Ness Monster, you don't call it the big eel. Is it because the dreamer realizes in the dream and concretizes the name? Is that why you go with it? I think, Tanara, uh, Tara, what you're uh, speaking to is uh, consistency. But I have to say that um, there are some times when I'm uh, looking at a dream and the uh, I feel just particularly questioning of the dream ego. Other times my energy shifts to different priorities, but I think it's still a a valid frame to hold. Um, How did she know it was the Loch Ness monster rather than just some kind of a giant squid, you know, coming out of the water is a great question. And it does seem to be something that the ego is layering onto it. I think the other participant who said that it doesn't actually feel quite congruent with what one might imagine about the Loch Ness Monster. What we might do is harvest some personal associations that could be relevant or helpful to the interpretation that there's something in the idea of Loch Ness 
that means something to her. But I would say that it is probably not overly relevant to this on an archetypal level. What well, what she knows is that she's encountered a monster, and we were we probably weren't as precise as we might have been about whether it was really the Loch Ness monster because I don't think the Loch Ness monster has long tentacles. It's usually imaged as Jeanette said as a big serpent, or it looks like sort of a brontosaurus sometimes. But she's she's got an encounter with a monster, whereas in the dream last night. The dream ego thought it was a wizard, but it didn't behave like a wizard. In this dream, the monster behaves like a monster. So I think there's a fluidity about just the different attitudes we can hold about a dream to not be overly rigid. And of course, I'm, I'm like just tracking time. So there's one more <laughs> comment, and then we're going to move on to another dream. So Deborah Hughes, you had your hand up. I just had a quick question because of... I, I don't know why I sensed this as an early dream, maybe just because of her age. So I wondered if it was significant since she's in the ocean, the presence of salt to have a monster oh, and, yeah. and then she's in, it's in salt water. So the alchemical factor, that's all. Oh yeah. That's a lovely amplification. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very, very much to all of you who submitted a dream. We're not going to get to all of them, but we really, really appreciate it. Should we go on to our next one? Sure. This is female, 32 years old. Uh, It started in a large shared home with many rooms, most of them with multiple beds. I was looking for the right bedroom to stay in and had narrowed it down to two options. I made my final choice, and as I was walking in, I passed a few beds with people sleeping in them. In one of the beds was my sister, awake and staring at me in the dark with a creepy look on her face. I was with a couple of friends that helped me organize and put together the room. It was bare and cold when we first arrived, so a fire was lit in the parlor room attached to the bedroom. I watched the fire as it grew and became usually animated. I think that's probably meant to be unusually animated. The fire began spewing coals out onto the ground, turning the wood floors red with heat. The room was definitely warm at this point, and just as the fire seemed to be getting dangerously out of control, a thick, cooling rain began falling from the ceiling. The burning cherries of wood on the ground were extinguished, and a pleasant steam filled the room with humidity. Outside the windows, I saw a lush green tropical forest, and the space now felt inviting, warm, and comfortable. This is when I suddenly went into labor. My perspective shifted in and out of third person. I would watch myself from a bird's eye perspective and immediately be very grounded in my body, clearly feeling the sensations of giving birth. At this point in the dream, I had short, dark, curly hair rather than my usual straight, long hair. The birth process was graceful and my body felt opened and transformed, specifically the lower pelvic region. I held the child and began breastfeeding while also nursing my own wounds. There was an exceptional amount of blood, but this seemed normal and healthy in the dream. I took a moment to observe all the blood and ponder the miraculous events that had just occurred. From there, I attempted to integrate normal daily errands like grocery shopping while my body was still lightly bleeding from the birth. It says, um, I dream of big labyrinth style homes with many bedrooms fairly often, and it seems a common theme that I'm looking for the right room or bed to stay in. The main feelings in the dream were transformational and intense, but also completely normal, honestly difficult to describe. Finally, she says, I'm not pregnant, nor have I ever had children. And uh, she does mention that she and her sister have a difficult relationship. Well, you know, I usually, you know, start right with the very beginning. And what I'm thinking about immediately is she's in a large shared home with many rooms and multiple beds. And she's looking for the right place for her to be. Um, And there's her sister. And there are a couple of friends that helped her organize. So here's this whole sort of community, family, shared uh, situation. And then we have the fire and the rain and the tropical forest. And then it goes into her own unique, bodily, amazing, individual experience of giving birth. So uh, it feels like a kind of a movement from a collective to an intensely 
individual experience, a generative experience. She said it feels transformational, and I I have no doubt about that. It certainly um, seems to be uh, a, a big, big image of transformation. One of the things I noted about it is this really, uh, well, first of all, we have the kind of confrontation with the shadow when she walks past her sister. Uh, and it's, you know, it feels sort of unfinished and uh, there's not there's not much to be said about it. But somehow that encounter with the sister seems to precede this really uh, interesting process where it goes from being cold so the fire's lit and everything's getting hot and kind of out of control. And then, um, and then this rain falls. So we, we, we're really in, in some alchemical imagery here. The, the fire would be the calcinatio, you know, or, or that, that which kind of burns something away. Um, that's the heat of affect as well. Mm-hmm. And then the, the cooling rain comes. The cooling rain is very much like um, in volume 16, but the heavenly dew falls. And Jung says the falling dew is a portent of the divine birth now at hand. So very much part of a cycle um, that is leading to some new thing, some new generativity. Um, because this is a very strange kind of rain, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it falls from the ceiling. This is all happening in this um, rather ordinary space. So there's some, there's some real process. We can think about the when-then in the dream is when this process has completed. So we've got the, the fire and then this rain falling, the cooling rain falling from the ceiling that is, and and then, you know, everything kind of blossoms and it's a lush green tropical forest and it's comfortable. Then she gets birth. So somehow this psychic process has to complete itself before the new birth can come. I think all of that makes really good sense. Uh, I'll, I'll want to lift up just as another lens on it, that the whole dream could be an opportunity to renovate the sister complex that she lets us know that she and the sister have been estranged but she comes into this space in the psyche psyche that is bare and cold and that is part of the way that she conceives of the sister relationship the sister complex when she comes in the proximity of the sister a fire is lit and the fire gets out of control any of us that have conflicts with our siblings know exactly what that's like, especially when you go home for the holidays. So all of a sudden <laughs> you get in the proximity of the problematic family relationship. And all of a sudden, not only is there a fire, but the fire is spilling out uh, into the bedroom and onto the floor. And it's really getting much too hot to handle. But what's modeled in the relationship in the dream is that her psyche can tolerate that where it's possible her ego doesn't believe that or doesn't know that to be true. The reason we're estranged from people is often that, and often for very good reasons, that the relationship is too hot to handle, Mm -hmm. Uh, that the sibling might very legitimately be misbehaving or behaving very badly in ways that are just too hot for us to want to manage or they evoke affects in us that are just too damaging. But here the inner sister is part of the environment. The fire comes forward and something inside of the psyche, which I would call the transcendent function, constellates this thick cooling rain and shows that she is able to generate something that is unique and responsive inside of the psyche that she can trust that something else will come in to transform and that when the objective psyche intervenes in the disproportionate heat with the relationship the world becomes generative and is restored and she herself like the jungle becomes fecund Mm -hmm. so what i would suggest is that 
the problem with the sister relationship, which might at first just seem to be social and and perhaps maybe not even of great consequence in terms of just distancing from it, it creates a problem inside of her that the psyche is working very hard to solve and in fact looks like it has solved. Because dreams are events, right? She had the event of cooling the fire and becoming fertile, and the whole world in her became fertile. And then she gave birth to a new attitude towards Mm -hmm. whatever the sister represents. If she's a shadow figure, so be it. Something that she finds so distasteful about herself that she cannot tolerate seeing it in the sister, as Jung has promised, becomes the great fertilizing force that when we find a way to relate to the shadow, we become fecund. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a lovely image. I'm glad you, you found it. I held the book up, but, uh, you know, the here's the dew sort of falling. And, and, and I think uh, it's very much, it shows if you were exactly right to call that the transcendent function, right? I think that's what yeah. the dew is. That's good. There it is. And uh, what Jung says is it's Gideon's dew, a sign of divine intervention the moisture that heralds the return of the soul. And um, I think you just started to venture into, uh, there's an external world sister, but it's her psychological shadow as well. Mm -hmm. This is an image of her psychological dynamic that is clothing this issue for her as, as her sister. So something uh, deep reconciliation seems to have taken place with, within as she gives birth to the new thing. I, I thought the ending was really interesting and deserves a comment <laughs> because there's this thing about her wounds and, and all of the blood. And then, uh, you know, she's pondering, she's observing the blood. And then she, she wants to go about daily errands like grocery shopping while she's still bleeding. So it's sort of it's sort of like what's the aftermath of this? It's it's been costly. It's been costly. You know, I wonder too about whether there's um, you know some similarity to the preceding dream where the dream ego thought that uh, the monster was just an illusion or uh, a, a giant eel. Of, uh, and I would you know wonder about whether this last part is the dreamer is ready to integrate this incredible happening, um, you know, into herself and resume normal life or whether it's a little dismissive. Too quick, too quick of a a resolution. Exactly. Too like, okay, well, that was great. Now let's get out there and, you know, hit the produce aisle. So, uh, you know, that I would, I would wonder about is whether, um, there needs to be more attention, more assimilation, more a, a kind of healing after childbirth, uh, and not jump too quickly back to grocery shopping. Uh, I, I totally um, can see that. Uh, I would also like to add an additional attitude, which is one of the ways that we know we are recovered from a negative complex is that we are able to hold it lightly. Mm -hmm. So the fact that if this is a sister complex that's been resolved, it's rather nice to go, well, you know, so I'm bleeding a little bit and uh, let's go out and get some food and, you know, let's just go on with the relationship already. And Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like, you know, it's like you could spend hours on this dream. Well, one thing I'd also like to say is that the, the thick liquid dripping from the ceiling you know, it reminds me a bit of semen. So, <laughs> so the idea of being impregnated by the divine is rather, you know, hmm. a, a kind of recurrent yeah. theme that something from the transpersonal has come into her and created this miraculous birth. Mm-hmm. And that what she is giving birth to is some kind of an amalgam between her own known personality and archetypal material that is trying to express through her, it'd be very uh, rewarding to look over the next few weeks and months to see what kinds of new things that the dreamer is uh, 
finding compelled to nurse, to, to raise in herself and in her life. That could be rather extraordinary. Sundance, you, you had your hand up. I was just struck by the word, the, um, the cherries, the, the yeah. word cherries in there. The burning cherries of wood on the ground were extinguished and a pleasant steam filled the room with humidity. That, that sentence, I don't know, it just seemed like an unusual way to talk about pieces of burning wood on the ground, that word, and, it, you know, remind me of sexuality, of, of uh, uh. You know, popping your cherry, that whole thing, like <laughs> that, that word made me think of. And, um, you know, so I, I don't really have the, the answer. I just mm -hmm. am bringing it into the conversation. Yeah, that's interesting. You're right. That struck me too. April, is your hand raised? Yes, I just want to mention that it, it also feels like incense. Mm. Mm -hmm. huh. Also thinking about just being in a sauna, those of you yeah. that may have thrown water on the embers yes. and how delicious it is to those clouds of mm -hmm. you know, steam that envelop and how your body reacts so differently to dry heat versus steam room, you know, humid heat. You know, these different things, interesting things kind of happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Tara. Uh, I just want to make quick mention, because Joseph, you mentioned the transcendent function, and I, I see it literally in having the bird's eye view mm. and in and out of the third. But I was just curious how you would approach the analyzan, you know, in, in the unfolding of this as, as opposed to getting right into the um, interpretations that you're doing. I was just curious if you can speak to that in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that we work with dreams on the podcast is really different than the way that I, at least the way that I work with dreams when I'm actually in a session, because you've got the whole person, you've got all of the story, you, you, you know, all of this kind of context around it. It's actually almost harder. We, we get to kind of just skip all of that in, in this kind of artificial way that we do it on the podcast. Not that, not that I don't think that, that what we're picking up when we work with dreams this way isn't um, very valid, but it, it's not really linked to, to the person and it's not relational. And dream work is very relational when you're doing it in an analytic session. And Jung is very clear that um, first you have to establish the personal context of what comes up for the dreamer. You know, what, does this, what is this like? What color was it? Uh, what comes up for you? And he gives an example uh, of a dreamer who dreamt about a table and uh, in his dream. So there's just an innocuous piece of furniture, but that it turned out that this table uh, had a very powerful meaning for the dreamer. That it was like the dream, uh, like the table his father uh, had, and he had sat across from his father and basically sort of been banished. What we can do while we're when we're on the podcast or what we're doing here is. So, sort of trace some of the the symbols uh, and just the storyline of the dream. And I could imagine that um, there would be lots of other details that the dreamer could supply that would add a whole lot uh, to this or any other dream. Tara, I'd also like to say that there are different schools of analysis and people work differently. Um, and, and these things are still differentiating. That um, and there is a classic school of analysis. There is a developmental school, an archetypal school. Um, there is a, a, an emergent psychoanalytic Freudian prioritization that's rising up in certain Jungian circles. So things are really changing a lot. I find myself wanting to work more and more classically, that I will prioritize dreams, and I will seek to venture an, an interpretation before the end of the session, which my friends who work more developmentally might say is, is a lot, or maybe even too much to provide. But I'm developing a tremendous confidence in the medicine of the dream 
and a tolerance for the fact that the medicine might be intense, even a kind of chemotherapy sometimes. And I find that my clients are adapting well to that. And I try to explain myself when I bring in new clients that you know, I tend to work more intensely than perhaps other schools of analysis might do. So part of it has to do with the relationship and even the expectations within the analytic frame. Annalie, your hand is raised. Yes. Um, I noticed um, that she nursed her wounds and still bleeding. And so what came up for me was the wounded healer. So I felt mm. like this dream had healing that she experienced but that might be ahead for her as she integrates it and she goes about her grocery shopping, mm-hmm. does her everyday <laughs> life, that she might really um, be having, see, can begin to see herself also as a wounded healer, that she might be mm. the one who can bring healing into the world because of this experience. Because we're not mm-hmm. just meant to have these numinous experiences and not bring back something. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. So this dreamer is male and 26 years old. I am running through a wide and shallow canyon with sparse but vibrant vegetation. I feel exalted. The canyon walls stretch higher, towering overhead. My pace slows as the canyon floor narrows, and I am funneled out of the canyon into a ghost town. The buildings are quite tall, lining both sides of the street without a single gap between them. I approach a door with curiosity, and as I touch its handle, I receive the impression that it was mine in a forgotten past. I enter the building, finding myself in the foyer. To my left, I see a dusty gymnasium. It holds no interest to me. Curiosity beckons my gaze upward, where I see a brilliantly sparkling chandelier adorned with thousands of small white crystals. It is dazzling in a scene otherwise comprised of wood and accumulated dust. Directly in front of me is a staircase leading to a wide door. As I take my first step in approaching the stairs, I feel a phantom pass through me and I'm overwhelmed with terror. And I'll just say, uh, context provided is, um, I had moved from a rural area into the city about four months prior to this dream. I had also begun making my first serious inquiry into spirituality following eight years of avoidance. So. Uh, I, of course, would love to get his associations to the word phantom. Uh, and okay. this goes to what uh, Tara had brought forward. You know, what what do we trust to the ego's interpretation of the phenomena? But we can say that something transpersonal uh, becomes visible. And not only visible, but interacts intimately with the dreamer, passes through his corporeal body, just to make sure he he has an absolutely uh, direct experience and encounter of this. Uh, and I think the I would spend a lot of time asking the dreamer to discuss the terror in all its nuances. I might venture uh, that what he calls terror is awe. And we don't have words for awe because in this modern world, we are so rarely awed by anything. Mm-hmm. We're so saturated by imagery. Our world is so controlled. I have to say that I think I must have been, I don't know, maybe about 26 or 27 years old. This work for me was still fairly new. And it wasn't until I had driven across country and I had seen the Pacific Ocean for the first time, and I'd been raised in the Atlantic uh, on the East Coast, and the violence of the Pacific shore was so um, intense for me, and I was filled with this overwhelming certainty that the ocean could and would probably kill me if I got into the water, which I'd never experienced being raised on the East Coast, and this feeling of uh, that came upon me was my was truly awe. Uh, it was this absolute sense of the power, the dread, the uncontrollability, the size of it, the strange alien intelligence of this ocean. And and at that time, I I didn't have adequate words, but it was a full 
physical sensation. So what I'd submit to the dreamer is the possibility that the correct word or the full word is awe. And, you know, awe of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I wonder if the dreamer expects the spiritual experience to be exalting and exalted and kind of thrilling, like it is in the beginning in this canyon. But it's almost like the psyche has a different plan because he's funneled. He says, I am funneled. So it's almost like something's being done to him mm -hmm. into this ghost town. So the psyche's trying to draw his attention to these old abandoned buildings that were his from a forgotten past. It's almost like the psyche is saying, look at this. And then he finds the dusty gymnasium and the dream ego is like, I don't want to know about that. That's not interesting to me. I want to look up at that beautiful chandelier. You know, so we've got maybe like a little bit of that kind of spiritual bypass thing going on. Like, I don't want to look at the old dusty gymnasium. Let me look at the, at the, at the beautiful chandelier. It's dazzling. You know, and that, that this is the way spirituality should be. It should be dazzling. But that's when the, the phantom comes and passes through him. Again, it, a little bit like the first dream. You know, the psyche's not going to let him miss his encounter. He wants to be focused on that which is um, beautiful and transporting. But it's like, no, it's not necessarily going to be like that. Yeah, I, I had that same image of the funnel of... Uh, you know, a real uh, directedness in this dream from, you know, the canyon, it gets narrower. Yeah. And, and then you're in a ghost town, but then you get into a building, then there's a particular room. And I would be very curious as to, you know, whether the sparkling chandelier is altogether just sort of the, uh, the spiritual bypass or the you know, oh, let's look at something beautiful. Um, it could be that, and it could be something something else, uh, something that's numinous in this old ghost town where things are dusty. And then the encounter. Yeah. The encounter with the objective psyche of something that he is being called to pay attention to, whether he wants to or not. And we've seen this in, uh, you know, certainly in the first stream with, with the uh, Loch Ness type monster, of that that we, the, the our whole theme for uh, these two days is that psyche is real. It, it will come toward us, much like Jonah and the whale or Job. These things really happen. They are real encounters. I, th I think that there, there is an encounter here and it occurs as he's beginning to move up the staircase, which is curious. And I don't know that we know much more about it, but my sense is that something before there's the progression forward, there's something from the past that needs to yes. be looked at. Yeah. And he does say that his feelings in the dream were euphoric curiosity and terror. You know, so I think I'm holding that, you know, that openness to, well, there's the experience. Lawrence, your hand is raised. Yes, thank you. Um, it, for me, this has a really strong Puera overtones. Like I can feel the, the young man um, <laughs> with that exaltation and, and everything. Yeah. And, and then instead of, of flying up, towards the sun and, and, and uh, his wings melting and plummeting to his death. Instead, he's channeled, it says canyon, and, but it feels more like a, a cave, like he's going on his, a quest there. And that quest is, seems to me to be like this, uh, visiting the, that whatever's neglected from the past, actually. Um, and, he, and he comes in and he, he turns away from the gymnasium, this place where the young warriors like should be interested, and instead is, is is, is overcome with this or enraptured by the, the chandelier. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me like this is moving from that, from adolescence to um, the next stage in the spiritual quest. Yeah, I'm more mature. I really, really like that. And, and, and I want to say that, you know, at 26, this is sort of exactly where it's like very developmentally appropriate, you know, where this person is. But yeah, that's, that's great. I love that you called it a quest and you, and you took up 
the fact that the young warrior should be interested in the gymnasium. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I want to add that uh, that chandelier, uh, although it's it's both, it is a self symbol. Yeah. Uh, something that is brilliant, that is multifaceted, uh, and that it may be the telos of the dream. But first, he has to be in the dusty gymnasium and deal with this uh, phantom. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit like receiving the image of the grail at the very beginning yeah. of the grail quest. That, yeah, that's perfect. Um, Jeanette. Hi. Yeah, I, I was off on a little fantasy. I, I find myself thinking with that really last sentence in the dream about Scrooge and mm-hmm. being taken by the, by the ghost of Christmas past to confront his past. And it, I just got myself mm-hmm. lost in that, really. Oh, that's I don't know whether it was you, Lisa, or Deb that was saying something about this being a confrontation with the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's a lovely kind of amplification. Deborah, is your hand up? Yeah, just real quickly. I was thinking, Hillman always used to talk about l'esprit d'escalier, the spirit of the staircase. Mm. And um, I looked it up, which I've never done before. And here's an interesting sentence. It's from Diderot. The sensitive man, such as myself, entirely absorbed by things that are being objected to him, loses his mind and recovers it only at the bottom of the stairs. Oh, uh, wow. Now, I think Hillman used to use it in the context of the ancestors. Mm, oh, my gosh. That's not the context here at all. So just really interesting synchronicity. That's well, it, it kind of is. He's in a ghost town, which implies Oh, yes. The past. Yes, and he uses the word phantom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's great. But Deborah, what, what was the first thing you said uh, that made you look this up? Something of the stairs, the spirit of the stairs? It means spirit of the staircase. And Hillman, I used to follow Hillman around back in the... Um, late 80s and early 90s, and because he was such a clear-thinking compensation to my own drowning in intuitive feeling. But in any case, he would refer often when working with dreams to l'esprit d'escalier, the spirit of the staircase, (laughs) and that we encounter it in our own lives, in our own homes, particularly our family homes, that something bigger than ourselves can catch us there as we move between realms, you know, move levels. Uh, Yeah, yeah, that's that's just great. That's new to me. I would never want to report him inaccurately, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's a fascinating addition. But that makes a lot of sense to me, Deborah. Um, I think the idea that this is an archaeologic site, even if it's only from the 1800s, you know, relative to somebody who's 26, you know, that's quite a long time ago. So it reminds me of the ghost towns, you know, in, mm-hmm. in the West that one might come upon and in this archaeology, you know, he finds something that has defied decay and defied being soiled, which is often associated with gold, you know, the, the precious thing in the archaeologic um, environment. I love the, uh, the idea that the staircase has its own spirit, and just yeah. as he approaches it, this spiritual realm is activated. Yeah, that's great. I to realize that Hillman is such a, a reliable narrator of the Puer experience. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he knew his own way so clearly. That's all. Beautiful. That's just, that's a real gift. Um, we have one more hand raised, um, and that is Sundance. Thank, th- this has just been so great, by the way. That, mm-hmm. uh, thank you so much, and I hope you guys come back. Mm-hmm. Um, but for this dream, the thing I was thinking about is, I think sometimes the draw of the spiritual life is somehow you will get away from mm. the messiness, the past, mm-hmm. like I'm going to yeah. go to the light and the spiritual and the exhilaration. And this dream is really saying, oh, actually, no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> deeper. We're going deeper into the stuff you're trying to escape from. So, yeah. You, not only are you not getting away, you're going to, you're really going to encounter it on a new level. Yeah. So I, I just think it's wonderful. Yeah. Sundance, that's a great, a great point. And I'm appreciating Deb's point it, that the, like the chandelier, for example, can be a both and both are like, um, a kind of a shimmering mirage of, you know, sort of like, let me escape from this messiness. 
and at the same time, an image of what might await this dreamer years down the road as he continues on his quest. It also begs some curiosity about what a chandelier is. And yes, I mean, they're beautiful, but they were a very efficient way of taking a small amount of light and refracting it so that it could fill a larger space uh, in these unique patterns. But it was very pragmatic, particularly in this world of candles, that in and of themselves might not actually generate as much light as one might need. So there's something about the chandelier which amplifies as well as aestheticizes the light, which may go again to Deb's uh, idea of uh, the idea of the grail and the alluring light versus the harsh light, or perhaps what might be a small light. So there's a, the enhancing of it is so dazzling. But I think everybody's comments are just really helpful. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really nice to do this in a group, actually. You guys should all come on the podcast with us every week. <laughs> Looks like April's hand is raised. I just want to mention th that it feels like there's a definite relationship between the dusty gym and the light giving chandelier. Mm. Mm. There's also this very interesting reaction that I'm having in the dream is that I find uh, I find the fellow in the dream so likable. Mm -hmm. You know, in this in the same way that you know when you watch the movies like Stand by Me or Goonies, or something like that, that, you know, this courageous, youthful, uh, you know, audacity um, is just very appealing, and I think goes a long way on the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is great. Yep. Let's just open it up. Um, Anne, Anne Warren. Not a question, but it's, I um, didn't get a chance to put it in the chat, that Donald Kalshed had recommended a film, A Monster Calls, that is almost a duplicate of the dream last night and I think relates to some of the other monster ones where uh, a young boy who is having a lot of problems to deal with essentially draws a tree that becomes at least 30 feet or it becomes a, and turns into a monster that ends up guiding him. And it's quite a beautiful oh. a monster calls. Yeah. I've read the book actually, it, it is beautiful. You know, there's something to be said for abandoning the word monster and, and calling it a god. You know, in the ancient world, they just called them gods. You know, I think the Latin definition is something, um, an image or a force of divine portent uh, from some archaic Latin. And that came up for me in what you said, Joseph. Of it, they're kind of gods. They really, really are. And to step into Hillman's world a bit, it's not that they're kind of gods, but maybe they are gods. Yes. <laughs> they yes. actually are gods. <laughs> it comes from the Latin, get this, it comes from the Latin for to remind, warn, instruct, or foretell. Yes. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. This is Jane. I have a quick question. Some of us are very accustomed to looking at our dreams and are very excited about doing that and probably have ample resources to figure out where we would go and how we would think about dreams. Some of us are new to this. If you were to think about a good resource for beginning to look at your dream in a thoughtful way, where would you send someone? Dream school? Yes, I was going to say, it's an opportunity for another shameless plug. Thisjungianlife.com. <laughs> 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 yes. Go immediately to thisjungianlife.com. And as a supplement to that, if you were thinking about a small book, that would just kind of organize somebody's thoughts. I'm thinking of intuitives who have to have some sort of a framework to hang stuff on. I really like Robbie Bosnack's book. What's the name of it? A Little Course of Dreams? Yes, yes. yeah, A Little Course on Dreams. A Little Course of Dreams. I like Whitmont and Pereira, A Portal to the Source. Um, it really chunks it up in a good way that's compensatory to intuition, but uh, doesn't at all negate it. I am. Um, I'm the only person in the world that ever recommends Marianne <laughs> Mattoon's book, Understanding Dreams. Apparently, it is. It is for some reason, it, it just antagonizing to some people. But I think that it's brilliantly clear that she, long before there were any searchable indexes, 
Marianne Mattoon culled the collected works, pulled everything salient about dream interpretation and stuck it in a book and then organized it. And she's a tremendous thinking function. So it's almost a manual of quotes and steps to take, which uh, when I was in training was such so refreshing to just have a method. Uh, so I recommend her book very highly. And um, we've just had a request to put the names of these books in the show notes, and, and we can certainly do that. I just want to say, too, you know, maybe everyone here already listens to the podcast, but, you know, I kind of think that the way we deal with dreams on the podcast can serve as an introduction that isn't too intimidating to dream work. I mean, I've certainly heard feedback from people that that's what it's been for them. So that is another possibility. I just want to say, Lisa, just last night, um, for an hour and a half, sitting with the three of you and everyone, I then revisited my recent dreams to send one in, and I read them different, Mm. you know, Uh, and I saw the way uh, the numinous was saying, I'm your companion. Yeah. Yeah borrow a phrase from Deb because I met you all through episode 40, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which is why I'm here now. And um, just sitting once with you already informed the way I take in my great. I also wanted to just really acknowledge the incredible focus on Von Franz's last lecture to to be able to have an opportunity to sit with this and um, one of the most poignant pieces for me was the one this whole making and to understand how it is that we both come into the empathy and the care of another Mm -hmm. but we maintain a proper uh, individual distance from the other that allows a respect for their own individuation. And um, I feel like something you had said, Joseph, a while back that I've been holding so much power in, about whether we bring the re- realness of our experience with the luminous into the social setting or we hold it and clear the weeds for all of the affect that sits in us that keeps us from that so that we develop our feeling function more deeper. I understand, I think, why people don't do it because it's so painful to detach from the relationship, from the idea of the connection we might have when, when we differentiate and we see the other mm-hmm. holding these, coming out of that illusion within ourselves and then seeing the people we love in them, where we can't join them in the same way anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wanted yeah. to name that as a deep grief in the individuation process for myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wondered if Franz, Franz spoke about that anywhere. Because it just feels so like such a big piece of personal yeah. work. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think the paradox is that as we differentiate, it it actually enables us to be really related. Uh, because if we are somehow fused with or you know enmeshed with the other person, we're not in relationship. A relationship takes takes two. And I'm also just making a comment of my own um, as we come to an end of our time together. Um, I think this whole time has really just been so illustrative, I hope for you, it has for me, of the what Jung had carved over the door of his house in Kushnak, that summoned or not, God will be present. We, we go there or it comes after us. Take your pick. <laughs> and maybe that's a good place to leave it for today. Thank you so much. Thank you to Natalia uh, and to Jane. 
uh, for hosting us. And we were yes, really happy to you. come. And thanks to the Young Society of Washington. Thank you so much for all, all right. of you coming and joining. It's just been, well, I'm going to use an overused term. It's been magical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been really lovely to have you all here and we can't thank oh. you enough for joining us so thank we will you. look forward to the next time okay nice thank you, you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. lovely to be had by everybody thank you all Bye. Bye. you've been listening to this Jungian life from our website this you can follow us on twitter like us on facebook Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.